So we've all probably heard the statement. Uh, I'm not a religious person, but I'm a spiritual person. What does that even mean? Have you, you guys have all heard somebody say that, right? I'm not religion, but I'm, I'm, I'm a very spiritual person. You know, so many people focus on their spirituality. You know, and so what that really means in a nutshell would be somebody that would, um, most of the time we hear that coming out of somebody that's not a believer in Jesus Christ. But sometimes we do hear that out of Christians too. But in a nutshell, what that really means is, well, I'm not really following a specific type of religion, but I'm striving to be a good person, right? I'm trying to get in tune with my spirituality, with my heart, my soul, and my mind. I'm trying to do good. I'm trying to love people and care for people. And that is such a commendable thing. But so in a nation that is rampant with distractions, with the anxieties, with hatred, that when somebody says that, there's been so much hurt. I mean, even from a secular point of view, when we know that we have a spirit, even those who suppress the truth about God and exchange his truth for a lie and worship what the creator created rather than the creator himself, We have the anxieties that kick in. And sometimes people will go to a secular psychiatrist and they'll give them all these things to do. They'll say, do this, get your mind, redirect your mind away from these things, the things that are bringing you anxiety and the depression. We want to redirect your mind away from those things. That way you're not focusing on that, right? And we we do the same thing with people that are prune and always stubborn and mad and never have a, 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 seem like they have a joyful bone in their hearts. This is what happens when we really have a, not a real clear idea of what it means to be a spiritual person. But we as the church do the same thing. It's, so I'm not like bashing the secular society, because we as the church will do things when we have a brother or sister that's dealing with life stresses, and their spirituality starts to get hit and beaten down. We'll point them to a verse like, that we're going to read today. You know, or we're going to, we'll point them to a verse that, that Matthew, in Matthew, when Jesus started the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount, and said something like, um, you know, do not be anxious, because your Father in heaven feeds the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, and how much more does your Father care about you? Stop being anxious. That is sin. And, but does that really help our friends, whether they're Christian or not? Does that really help our brothers and sisters when they're... They're dealing with the anxiety. Or maybe when they're dealing with brokenness in such a way that there really is no real joy out of them because the the things come into their their lives. You know, in our own mindset, we might strive to not be anxious about things, but we'll say, "How how can I get control of my spirituality when everything is closing in on me? Oh, church, don't we feel like that now? Don't we feel like that constantly? The world is closing in on us. But as a church, we don't want to cherry pick a Bible verse and say, don't be anxious about anything but in everything. With prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And stop sinning. Stop being anxious. That isn't the right way to handle things. Oh, that isn't handling things with love and compassion. I mean, is that true? When we get broken down, with the anxiety. Is that sin? It can be. But so can not rejoicing in the Lord. So can being harsh. So as we look at our text today, that is what the goal is to be, is to equip us to come, figure out how we can not deal with being an anxious person. No, I'm not here to promise you that after today's sermon that the Lord is going to supernaturally take all the anxiety away from you. But I'm here to tell you that there is a way in Scripture that your anxieties can be suppressed. And that's through the experience of that peace of God. So would you look with me today in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, so we can see how it is that we can obtain this peace of God, so that we can fight these things off. But so that you don't think that we're just going to carry pick a verse, I'm going to read the whole context to remind you of the context of what it means to strive for the peace of God. So if you look in your Bibles with me in chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Hear now the word of the living and true God. Therefore, my brothers... 
whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Eodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companions, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord. Always, again I say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. In the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. As far as the reading of the word of God, amen. I think in God's divine intervention, this passage is laid before us. Nothing happens outside of the realm of God's control. And a passage like this has brought so much comfort to Christians, but it's also brought so much hurt. It's so important for us to not rip a passage out of its context and to to be able to be taught by it and how to use the word of God, how God has intended for us to use it. It's so important to understand the context. See, we don't want to just say don't be anxious about anything because there's really anxiety. But what was the anxiety here in the church? It was, Paul was talking about being, having unity in the church, right? I mean, he, this was, whole thing was about a, a, a confrontation coming up. We were to agree in the Lord, having our mind set on the Lord, as he said in verse 2. These women have labored side by side in the gospel. We, last week we talked about how that was them being gospel-centered soldiers, right? That's where we want to focus at. So how can you obtain this peace of God? Because that's the only way you're going to be able to combat this, not being able to rejoice in the Lord. That's the only way you're going to be able to combat having, not having a reasonableness to you or having anxiety. You've got to know how you can obtain the peace of God. Well, the first thing is, is you got to, you you need to experience the peace of God before you can really take control of your spirituality. Look at the 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 last part of this section, just verse seven. It says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We have to ask, what is this peace of God? I mean, I I could give you all kinds of real in-depth philosophical uh, or even theological arguments, but it's real simple. Paul says it just a few verses down in verse 9. He says, you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So the peace of God is simply God's peace, right? I mean, that's what the whole word of means. It's the peace from God. You know, more clearly, I just want to read through a couple Bible verses, just real quick so that you can see, and just let this solidify in your heart that God's peace comes upon you. In, In John chapter 14, verse 27, our Lord and Savior himself, said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives you, I give you. Let not your heart be troubled. Oh, that's just so amazing. And let them be, not be afraid. Or even again, to flip to the right a little bit, in John 14, he says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace in the world You will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. See, sometimes people think the peace of God is just this happiness and this joy in our heart. There's no persecution. There's no hard times in our lives. But that's not what it means to have the peace of God. Jesus said, you know, you're going to go through tribulation. You're going to go through hard times. Just as he did. Jesus had the peace of the Father on him as he went to the cross. As he went through the tribulation of the the Pharisees and everybody around him. 
But there was something, that peace, that kept Jesus moving forward to the goal, to the end of the prize, the upward calling of God that's in Christ Jesus, right? I mean, later on, in Colossians 3.15, you guys hear me quoting Colossians 3.16 all the time because we're, you know, to sing a psalm, a hymn, and a spiritual song. But after that, we, he tells us that this peace, or right before that, excuse me, in 3.15, we learn that this peace of God is actually the peace of Christ. If you remember the high priestly prayer, Jesus prayed that we would be one with him as he and the Father are one. This is where we're to look to, is to Christ, having that peace of Christ. We're to be filled with the fullness of Christ, as it says in Ephesians 4.19. But see, brothers and sisters, we can't do that unless you have truly experienced the peace of God. See, because the word peace, the opposite of peace is what? War, right? It's really a state of being. But, so if you haven't actually experienced the peace of God, that is salvation in Christ Jesus, you are actually at war with God. You're at enmity with the Lord. You have to experience saving faith, saving grace, or this peace of God will never come upon you. But see, what happens is, as blood-bought believers in Jesus Christ, who have experienced the peace of God, our flesh comes in and beats us down. And we become in this spiritual war. You know, just to go back to saying our spirituality, we, we, we become in this spiritual war, and what happens, it's a, a collision between the physical and the spiritual. Sure, your spiritual realm, what you are, mind, heart, soul, body, facing to the Lord, you can't see, touch, feel, taste, or anything of that nature, but the things that are going on in your life and around you affect your spiritual. So when the spiritual is being directed from the physical, the spiritual is beat down. But yet, if the spiritual, if your mind, heart, soul, is focused on Christ and on the future glory... The physical is beat down. Not saying that we're going to have all things good, but you will be able to handle the life's, what's going on in your lives. See, this, this, this back and forth fight of the spiritual coming into the physical or the physical dictating what's going on in spiritual is something that isn't new. I mean, Paul said in Romans 8, 6, for to set your mind on the flesh is death. So if the things in the physical realm are beating us down and pushing us down, even though we've experienced peace, we're not at war with God, that, that, that physical realm is beating us down to the point of death. But to set your mind on the Spirit is life and peace. See, because to set your mind on the Spirit is, is to have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. Brothers and sisters, we need to experience that peace of God before we can take control of our spirituality. We need to trust in the promises of God. If God is for you, who can be against you? No one. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. It doesn't matter if you have a lost of a loved one, a cared one that is, has, went, has went to be with the Lord. It doesn't matter if you lose your job, lose your money. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter if your arm hurts, your shoulders hurt, your back hurts. It doesn't matter. You can trust in the promises of God. What are some of those promises of God? That you'll have a full resurrected body. That you will make it to future glory. Because you've experienced the peace of God. You've experienced the salvation of the Lord. And because He has raised, you will be raised. You can trust in those promises. See, in this text, Paul's reminding us not, that, not just to trust in the promises of God for a future hope, but also the hope in this present, in this present reality. Look to the Lord's presence, and he will be your mighty fortress. Look at the verse 7 again, just the second part of verse 7. He says, and he will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. Notice though in verse 5, he does say, the Lord is at hand. So if the Lord is at hand, he will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. 
See, this word guard is actually a military term. It, to mean like a garrison. And for those of you that have been in the military here, first off, I want to say thank you for your service. And, but uh, because today, this weekend, is Memorial or is Labor Day, right? So I thank everybody for their labors, but specifically those who have been uh, in the military and your labors to keep us free, right? But we, this weekend, but that's a side note. I don't want to go down that path too much. What is a garrison? It's something that, that, it's a bunch of troops stationed to defend, to guard. So this is Paul using a military term, and if you think about the book of Philippians, it's a military place where all the Roman soldiers would come, and that's where they would kind of retire, and the church was there. Well, Paul says, you know, that's where the church was being raised up in, in Philippi, a Roman providence where they worshipped Caesar as Lord and Savior. That was Caesar's name. And Paul's telling them, look to the Lord's presence, not to what's going around. He will be your mighty fortress. See, that's what it really means when it says that the Lord is at hand. It means he is near. So what are you looking to? When the, the nearness of Christ. You're looking to, as Paul has said throughout this whole letter, the day of Christ. Looking to the day of Christ. Looking forward to the future glory when Christ comes in glory. That's what we should be looking towards. That's how we can deal with the, 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 the spiritual and the physical. Looking to future glory. Not focusing on the, the thing at he, in our present reality. But we also do this through the nearness of his people. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you, as we read in our responsive reading. God dwells in you. When you come around brothers and sisters, whether it is in gospel-centered ministry, as a gospel-centered soldier, or you're being a ministry of presence, you're, 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 the, 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 the closeness of the Lord... It's working in you that's helping the brother and sister behind you or beside you. So you look to the presence of the Lord and he will be your mighty fortress. In other words, as you are together with one another, doing gospel-centered ministry or in gospel-centered fellowship, the Lord is at hand. The gifts that God has given you are, are building up and are acting as a garrison or a guard in the heart and the mind of your brother and sister. Oh. This is what the church needs. This is what we need here at the Montgomeryville Baptist Church. We need unity, the, the gifts of God being there to be to guard our hearts and our minds. Look to the Lord's presence through the gifts of the Spirit in His people. Look to be a peacemaker. That's what a, a guard is, right? They're trying to keep the peace. They're not wanting to be at war. But see, when the physical realm collides with the spiritual realm, and we think we're doing what's right in our own eyes, or we think that our spirituality is directing us and guiding us, what we're actually doing is we are at war and we're not bringing peace. We want to strive to have peace. But have that peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Brothers and sisters, just listen for a split second. I know some of you might be on one ear, not the other, right? But for those of you who don't, or who you are, wake up and listen. Listen to the words of our Lord and Savior as he started out his most famous sermon on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Behold, the Lord is at hand, Paul said in Philippians. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, because the Spirit of God works in the church to attach the presence of God, because the Lord is at hand. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the kingdom of earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God or daughters of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you and be glad, for your reward is greater in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Brothers and sisters, blessed is the church who strives to have that peace of God. That's what we're called to do. Look to the presence of the Lord. Look to His coming. Look to the church that's around you. Be united. But notice it's not just united in anything. It's united in the Lord. That He is there for you. This is where many miss the target in this spiritual war we're fighting. When hard times come, They'll just look at somebody and say, stop it. Redirect your attention. You know, don't, don't focus on those things. Let's, let's focus on this thing. And shamefully, I've heard many, and I must admit, I myself have said to people, stop it, it's sin. You know, we'll, we'll get things where people, I mean, is that true? Yes, it is sin. But that's not how you encourage people. Sometimes people may need to hear that because they're, it's clear that their attention is not directed on the Lord. But what about those who are, that are striving, and they're saying, please pray for me, and I'm praying to the Lord. What do we do? You, you see all kinds of posts on Facebook. Pray, 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 praying, sending prayers, sending prayers, pray, pray, pray. But nobody actually gathers together to pray. So here's my little plug-in. Are we gathering together for prayer meetings? Because prayer is powerful. That is where the peace of God comes upon those who are being prayed for. See, we don't want to miss this target. We want to become a prayer warrior. And when you become a prayer warrior, you will obtain the peace of God. Look in verse 6. When he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Now, some people rip that out of context and just, you know, don't recognize it. It's talking about unity within the church. But the church isn't this building. You are the church. You are the church. So, to experience this peace of God, we need to be united. It's not just a matter of you individually. Just stop sinning. Stop having anxiety. You know, if you're anybody that struggles with the anxiety, you know that is something way easier said than done. You just can't stop. You know, you, you direct all, every, everything that you got into, especially as a Christian, into looking to the Lord. But what is it that stops us from Focusing on our anxieties. It is that peace of God. Notice Paul has a, a, really a threefold method of prayer here. Now I'm not saying that he is flat out saying, pray exactly like this and that peace of God will come upon you. But he's really talking when he just says prayer. It's a general prayer. Pray without ceasing. Continue to pray. Pray for everything. Looking and hoping that God is going to feel, fulfill what your prayer is. It's a prayer of blessing. Lord, bless this time. But he also has really a, a second form of prayer. It's a prayer of supplication or petition, a request. You actually see a play in words here when he's saying to, with prayers of supplication and then let your request be made and known to God. So we are to be seeking God, right? Jesus said, ask anything in my name and it will be given to you. These are prayers of petition, prayers of intercession. At the beginning of the book of Philippians, as we got through it, as we went through chapter 1, Paul was interceding for the saints, right? He was saying in verse 9, I believe it was, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. We're interceding for one another. We're interceding even for ourselves. Lord, help me. I'm praying to you with everything, but help me and just pleading. 
But again, this isn't a, a guarantee that as long as if you pray without ceasing at all times, and then, uh, so that's step one, now step two. I mean, let's be real, who can do that? You, you can't walk around and, and you get fake people doing that, right? Blessed this and blessed that and blessed this. <laughs> just blessed everything. And you can see the fakeness on them. Now, some of them are just genuinely happy-go-lucky people. But so Paul's not giving you a, a model to say, pray like this, and it'll guaranteed be happening to you. But he does move on to saying praise of, prayers of thanksgiving. So when you're becoming a prayer warrior, and you're striving to obtain that peace of God, you know, you're looking to the presence of the Lord in all things, you're to give thanks for all things. You're to give thanks for the people's lives that are, are, are around you. You're to give thanks for the ones who have left to go be with the Lord. You're to give thanks for your pain. Because some way it is to point to the glory of God. Now, of course, that's much easier said than done. See, I have a saying that I've used, and I don't know if it, I honestly don't know if it's something that came into my mind years ago. But I, or if somebody said to me and it stuck with me. But I've always said when, when God's soldiers' knees hit the ground, the war isn't over. It's just began. It's when the God's soldiers' knees hit the ground. We're calling to Cal, the, the Calvary in from Calvary. As Jesus died on the cross, he bore the wrath of God for your pains and your sins. We know that he is sent, he, that your prayers are answered, they're heard. It just may not be the prayer you, or the answer you want to hear. Or maybe it hasn't come into full effect yet. But when God's soldiers' knees hit the ground, that's when the, the, the war ain't over. It's just beginning. That's when the peace of God will come upon you. You've got to strive to be a prayer warrior, brothers and sisters. And when you do that, that peace will come upon you. You will be noticing yourself praying more. You'll be interceding for others. Others will be interceding for you. You will give thanksgiving for everything that's going on in your life. Pray without ceasing. Pray with petitions. Men, for some reason, us in this culture, guys are too tough to pray. I don't know how many guys I've asked, are you a praying man? Oh, no, not really. Why? Why? You, you know the stuff's going on with your wives. Why are you not bathing them in prayer? I can't emphasize enough, and I'll quote it a billion times. The Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How can you do that if you're not praying for them? Pray with petitions, with thanksgiving. Sometimes we don't pray as much because we, do, we say we don't know how to pray. Well, you know, as I first became a Christian, I went through this discipleship program. and uh, So I'm going to give a little... Uh, Shout out to it. It's called Every Man is a Warrior. I would love to take some of you men through it. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. It gives you, shows you how to walk with God. But in that process, it, it also gives you an acronym to pray. It's called the war method. Come to think about it, maybe that's where I got the whole idea that when a God's soldier's knees hit the ground, the war isn't over. It might, it might be. I'd have to look back through my notes. But what is the word method of prayer? You start out praying, worshiping God, giving thanksgiving to Him with all things. So it's word, just W-A-R. Write it down and pray through it. Use it. It ain't going to be a, 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 a fix-all, save-all, but it helps you to pray. You worship God. Then you admit all of your sins. You admit what's going on. You search your heart and say, Lord, forgive me for not being conformed to your image. Help me to grow in the grace and knowledge of you. Forgive me of the, 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 the porn addictions that I have or the drinking addictions I have or whatever it may be. Forgive me for not being gentle and loving. And then you move on to requests. That, there is a difference between admitting and requesting. Requests are just as they are. Lord, help me with this or help me get this job or help me to get over this anxiety or to help me to be more in tune with your will. Help me to grow as a Christian and not walk in idleness. War. Worship, admit, and request. See, to obtain the peace of God, you must grow in your piety. You must grow in what God has for you. So when t sometimes people think of the word piety, they think that it is, you know, stiff-necked, board stuck up your rear end, 
And somebody somewhere is having fun and we've got to stop them from doing that. Right? Well, that's not what piety means. Some people think it is. But piety is simply striving to be the righteousness of Christ. Living your life to be righteous as Christ was. See, for Christians, there isn't a separation between our devotion and our ethics. Our devotion and our ethics is our unseparable responses to the grace of God. We can't separate them. But there's a reason I've taken this passage backward. Because sometimes they... People say, just as long as I strive to be joyous, just as long as I strive to let God know, and I'm praying, and I'm sending prayer, 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 sent, prayer, sent, I'm striving to be pious. No, you've got to experience that peace of God first. When you do experience that peace of God, and you obtain the peace of God, the, you'll, you'll grow in your piety. You'll strive to be as righteous as Christ. You'll strive to know Him. You'll strive to be a peacemaker. To experience the peace of God. And then you'll let the joy reign. That'll be your driving force. And when you let joy reign, you will obtain the peace of God. Look in verse 5. I'm sorry, verse, verse 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Always, again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice. See, we can strive to have joy. There's a difference between happiness and joy. I've mentioned this several times. Paul is not saying here, just be happy, happy, joy, joy, happy, happy, joy, joy, like Ren and Stimpy. You know, he's not saying be joyous just for the sake of being joyous. You can be prune lifted. I'm being happy right now. I'm happy. No. It's to have a genuine set of joy on you. He's saying, but he's not saying to rejoice in anything. I'm happy because I won a whole bunch of money on a lottery ticket. That would be good. But that, can, that ain't real joy. That's happy in, 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 in worldly stuff. Now, of course, the physical can affect the spiritual. But we need to be able to rejoice in the spiritual. Rejoice in the Lord. You'll know when somebody has a pure joy in their heart. When you've experienced this, you can rejoice in the tribulation. See, this isn't an attitude will determine my altitude. We don't want to tell people, hey, just stop worrying about your anxiety. Stop worrying about this. And just, you know, focus over here. Don't focus on these things. Because all that does is gives you the idea that your attitude will determine your altitude. Or your altitude will determine your attitude. That's not right. We don't want that. See, when, when you do that, you kind of walk through these fiery trials of testing. And when you do that without God, you're getting burnt. Constantly, left and right, you'll put your direction over here and you're striving and you're saying, okay, I'm not going to think about this anymore, but it's everywhere you go, you're getting burnt. See, when you walk through the fiery trials of testing with the Lord, the only thing that gets burnt off are the ties that bind you. If you're focusing on the Lord, those things that beat you down and hold you down and keep you closed in to where you say, how can I get control of my spirituality when everything is closing in around me, those ties when you're walking with the Lord are burnt off. You're free in Christ. That's easier said than done though, isn't it? You must embrace the will of the Lord in your situation. As Paul said in Romans 8.28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Now that verse has been ripped out of context so often and people that have had anxiety, hey, just don't worry about this. Just know that God is there. But if you fully embrace that, you can give prayers of thanksgiving. You can give prayers of petition. You can be thankful for what's going on. But we know that is much easier said than done. And I'm not suggesting that that you have this fake happiness. By all means, no. I'm saying that we should strive for joy by letting your gentleness reign through people, letting your gentleness be a part of you, that you may obtain the peace of God. Look in verse 5. He says, let your reasonableness, reasonableness be known to everyone. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. But this reasonableness, he's not meaning your logical reason. He's meaning how you are treating others. It, it, it could be interpreted flat out, just as I've just said, you, your gentleness. Or in moderations, if you're reading the King James, it'll say, let your moderation be known to everyone. 
See, that gentleness of Christ is to be modeled by all who follow Christ. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1. See, if you have that peace of God, you'll be striving to be gentle with all people. You will strive to, in your piety, to be doing what the Lord has for you to do. Because you have that peace of God. You recognize that the, the Lord is in your presence. And you want to be gentle in all situations. Sometimes you can be gentle and people will think, well, you're being mean. Or you're being hateful. But gentleness sometimes means boldness. But we are to strive to have a gentle character, to have a, a, a handle things in gentleness, to love one another, to everyone. See, when the anxiety kicks in, and our life starts to go into turmoil, or when we're just being not happy, not rejoicing in the Lord, we, it can sometimes cause us to be in a bad mood. Amen? It, we'll, we'll love people, but quite frankly, if one more person tells me to stop being anxious, I'm going to stick a knife in your eye. Right? Now, I know that's not you, it's the, the church down the road. So we're just kind of calling them out. None of you. But see, when you're striving to obtain that peace from God, when that peace of God has come upon you, that you know, you know that you have a future glory. You know that, that as you put on the imperishable, that your body will go into the ground and be raised as, in his, as his body was raised, that he died for the sins and raised for your justification. As the wrath of God was poured on the cross of Christ, that, that your sin was put there, that his righteousness was put upon you, and that you have peace with God, you're no longer in war with God. When you truly believe that in your heart, you will strive to be gentle in them situations. You will be looking to him. You know, sometimes a simple analogy of a child that puts their hand in a candy jar. You know, now, if mom says, no, you're not having that candy. And as soon as mom and dad aren't around, they open that cookie jar or that candy jar and they reach their hand in there. But yet if mom and dad are there, they're, right? I got caught. Well, see, even as us, as children of God, we'll put our hands in the cookie jar of relying on our own spirituality rather than looking to the presence of God. See, we must strive to mortify your flesh for outbreaks. Strive to be gentle even when things are beating you down and anxiety is kicking hold of you. When you don't have a, a, a joyful part in your body at all. When you just want to yell at somebody, you just want to scream, Ah! Why is this happening? Look to the presence of the Lord. Because the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God will surpass all understanding. Brothers and sisters, these four commands, notice they are in a command form. Many of us, the way we speak today, don't even recognize that we'll say certain things and it'll be in a form of command. Notice Paul doesn't say, would you rejoice in the Lord? No, he says, rejoice in the Lord. And then he says, again, I say, rejoice. Then he says, let your gentleness be known to everybody. This is a command. Then he says, do not be anxious about anything. Then he says, let your request be known to God. See, these four commands can't be obtained unless you really have that peace of God. That word and in, in, in verse 7 is huge. It actually shows the result of everything that happened before that. If all of this other stuff happens, you will experience the peace of God. It is a guaranteed you will experience the peace of God. Now that isn't saying that you can look back and say, well, I'm not experiencing the peace of God. I must be doing something wrong. No, but give thanks for what is going on in your life. See, because the Lord is at hand, you are commanded to rejoice in the Lord. Let your gentleness be seen by all while not getting anxious about anything. Instead, become a prayer warrior. 
then the peace of God will become that fortress that preserves you and all the brethren around you. It will guard everybody around you's heart and mind. Everyone around you. See, you obtain the peace of God by striving for piety that seeks the Lord's presence to preserve you. Don't just transfer your focus from one difficult situation to a fleshful distraction. That only puts a band-aid over a flesh wound. That only puts a band-aid over a missing arm or a missing hand or a missing eye or a missing foot. That's all it does. It doesn't fix the solution. It only puts a band-aid over it. Instead, seek the presence of God and you'll experience the peace of God which will display the power of God by surpassing all understanding. That's how all under, the, the, that, that surpassing peace of God it goes past everything is when you seek the presence of God. And when you do that, you'll experience that peace of God. Brothers and sisters, strive to do that. Seek the presence of God and you'll experience the peace of God. Let us pray.